Welcome to Making the Growth Mindset Come Alive in Classroom Practice with your presenter, John Steffier. So now what I would like to do is turn the meeting over to Charlene Maher, Marketing Manager for Corwin Press, to introduce today's presenter. Hi, thanks, uh, Jeff. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I am very honored and pleased to welcome John Safier um, to today's webinar as our presenter. John is the founder and president of uh, Research for Better Teaching, which is an educational consulting organization in Massachusetts, which is uh, dedicated to the professionalization of teaching and leadership. Um, you may best know him as the author of uh, eight books, including The Skill for Teacher, which has sold over half a million copies and is the Bible of teaching in hundreds of districts around the country and in over 60 university teacher preparation programs. His newest book is High Expectations Teaching, How We Can Persuade Students to Believe and Act on Smart is Something You Can Get, which is a joint publication with Corwin, Learning Forward, and by Delta Kappa. So thank you, um, John, for joining us, for uh, being with us here today. and. Um, Thank you for, uh, we look forward to this uh, presentation on making the growth mindset come alive in classroom practice. Take it away, John. Thanks, Cheryl. Can you hear me all right? Hello. Just fine. Yeah, perfect. Across all right. Good. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are on the East Coast, and good afternoon to those of you out West or in the Mountain Zone or Central Zone. This topic has become preeminently important to us at RBT because it pertains to the spiritual side of teaching as well as the cognitive and technical side. Um, you know, the title of the webinar is really, if I believe in the growth mindset, how is that going to show up in my daily classroom practice? And more than that, what am I going to do to make the kids believe it's true? And this especially pertains to low confidence, discouraged kids, kids who don't believe they have it or who have been receiving messages that they're less than for years and kids who are underperforming and we all have students who, who fit that profile you know kids who, who don't do their work or don't finish their work or who come late or who absent a lot uh, and uh, it is it's not that every single child we have doesn't want to succeed it's just that i may choose as such a child to be visible in ways that do not focus on academic prowess you know Kids have all kinds of ways of, of, of dealing with it when they've concluded they don't have it. They can, they can withdraw, have the hoodie up, maybe they decide to become the class clown, or they get into trouble a lot. Um, there are some teachers, though, who manage to change these kids' minds about themselves and about the worthwhileness of school, and students know who they are. Just going to play a, a video for us right now that's about a group of kids are sitting around a picnic table in the in the uh, in the backyard of a California high school, and I want I want you to listen for a minute to Justin and what he says about one of these people who made a difference in his life. Go ahead, Jeff, roll that. Well, Justin, what about you? Attitude of uh, effort and hard work. Has that carried over to other courses? Yeah, well, again with her, but yeah, because uh, yeah, it's carried to math, it's carried to like social studies, anything like that. 
So it's carried over to yeah other areas. So it's helped me like in all areas, like even out of school. Now, see, Andy says, oh, no, Justin says, she got me to want to learn. And Andy says, what did she do to do that? And Justin says, well, you know, she didn't have to say anything. It wasn't anything she said or did. Yes, it was. It was some very specific things that she said and did. Only Justin doesn't, didn't notice, doesn't remember specifically what they are. You know, it's not like he was in... Uh, an, an anthropologist or an ethnographer taking taking data on it. There are very specific things that people say and do to get kids to believe in themselves. It's a transformation where the student actually comes, as Jeff Howard used to say, to think that smart is something that I can get rather than something that you are. Now, um, the Things that people say and do to accomplish that come because of a conception of what the job of being a teacher is. It means that I have come to believe it's, it's my job to give the kids the belief that they can grow their ability and the confidence pertains to them. You know, they're, 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 they're and listen to the abstract information about the growth mindset and and we can share the research about it with it. posters up around the room. But John. Uh, yeah. Can I ask you to share your desktop again, please? Show the desktop. Yeah, I, I just think it would be good if you had your slides up. Oh, I, I thought it was. So I'm gonna go to let's see. Share my screen. I guess I have to do that every time we switch back and forth. Sorry. That's uh, correct. Yeah. So um, I was just going through this little litany here about the re reconstructed or added element of the job description of a teacher who takes on this. It's my job to give the kids the belief that it's true. The growth mindset is true. It's You can uh, get smart at math or smart at writing or smart at or good at any academic area. But you know what? It pertains to you too give you the confidence you can grow yours and then the tools to grow it, and along with that, the desire to want to. Now, um, all of the ways that we have been collecting over the last decade or so as evidence of how teachers accomplish this, we've collected into a list and it may, there's 50 items on it. It made me think of a song that Simon and Garfunkel sang in the 70s. A few of you listening to this may be old enough to remember. It was called 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. Slip out the back, Jack. Make a new plan, Stan. Anybody remember that? <laughs> if we were, we were in a room together, I'll bet this a few of you raise your hands and we'd have a little sing-along when the session's over. Anyway, there are at least 50 ways that we know that people accomplish this job. And I'm going to show you a video clip that lasts one minute now of one person doing one of those behaviors. Her name is Meredith. And it's a situation, you know, the, that shows that that happens dozens of times a day. Uh, it's a situation where a kid answers a question half right. In this case, she's going to say, who remembers the definition of natural resources? And Ricardo is going to say, um, you know, it's like bark and trees. Now, this teacher is a high gain teacher. She gets her kids to gain more than one year's worth of academic learning in, uh, in a calendar academic year. There's a clue in here about how she does that. 
one of many, many things she does. But I'd like you all to look at it just to try and identify what happens in this verbal back and forth between her and Ricardo. That could be some indicator of why she's getting these results with kids. Okay, if you would, Jeff, roll this one. Okay. Who wants to read question one for us? Go ahead, Abby. Uh, now, if we were in a room together, folks, we'd do a little turn and talk, and I'd ask you to compare notes and compare memories about things she did that you think could have something to do with this. But what I'd like to do now is to uh, put up the script and uh, review it with you. So let me open that up for you. There we go. That show up on the screen, Jeff? Looks good. Okie doke. So let's just go uh, go through it line by line, folks. Here he comes up with his half right answer. Uh, things you find on earth like tree sticks and bark. So she says, mm, I like you using examples. So there's a little validation right there. Things you find on earth. Now this piece of that, you, you need to add one more piece to that to help us understand. There's two things in that verbal behavior. One is she's given a cue. One thing more would make it complete, says she. And then she uses the language of thinking. She doesn't say one more piece to that to get it right, or one more piece to fix your mistake. It's one more piece to help us understand. And it's us, always inclusive language being used. Because right now you define nature. You want to call on somebody? So instead of her calling on somebody, she's putting him in the driver's seat and giving him some ownership and agency in what's going to happen next. So he calls, calls on favor that people can use, she says. So now, another thing that is consistent throughout uh, a high expectation teacher, she makes the kids talk in complete sentences. So put it all together in one good right definition, which the girl favor does. And now here's the key moment. She goes back to Ricardo and says, Ricardo, you see the difference? Uh-huh. So can you say it? So she makes him put it together into a full sentence, except he doesn't come out with it all. Natural resources are things people can use. He's sort of echoing what Faber said. And so she comes in with a little acknowledgement. Now you're missing the cool part you had before, and then he puts it all together. So the point is that this is a move where you go back to a kid who half correctly answered it or answered it wrong, and once the resources of the class, whatever they are, have been pulled together to get the complete explanation, then you go back to that kid and have them put it all together. So he gets to emerge in triumph because he synthesized it instead of being the kid who had to get bailed out by somebody else. Now this move has a name. It's called Persevere and Return. It's had a little history of research behind it. And it is um, one of these 50 things that people do. It happens to be in the categorical verbal behavior. And it is connected with a whole battery of things that teachers do, besides preaching about it, to actually get the kids to believe that errors are normative, errors are to be expected, and they are actually useful in constructing one's learning. Um, the, the 50 ways to leave your lover, as I affectionately call them, or 50 ways to get kids to believe in themselves, 
are divided up into seven categories. And we're going to take a look mainly at a few of the verbal behaviors today. And I hope you're interested enough in the others to uh, launch a little study of them in whatever way you do that. Um, in addition to verbal behaviors, that is one's choice of words when you handle a specific situation like we just looked at. There are classroom mechanisms, routines, structures for doing things like student goal setting. Uh, from the cognitive bank of research on teachers who are clear, there are certain very specific clarity uh, strategies that are directly in service of getting the kids to believe in themselves. Uh, finally, number four, category four, is things that you do to explicitly teach kids how to exert effective effort. Just to, it's not enough to just say effective effort makes more difference than anything. It's not about the inborn ability, it's about effective effort. For most of our kids, we've got to teach them what that means and how to do it. I'll spend just a few minutes introducing these other categories a little later on. So um, I'd like to stick with the verbal arenas now for a minute if I could and take up this one here. What do I say when a kid asks me for help? Mr. Safir, Mr. Safir, I can't do this. The case I want to make is that embedded in how we respond to that request for help are messages that kids pick up about whether we believe in them or not. I'm going to show you two scripts. One script is a person, a teacher who does not really have positive expectations for the kids, for this particular kid. The second script is somebody who does. Now, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to look at each one to decide which is which. And then I want to go back over the words, the choice, the language, the use of uh, phrases and in order to identify what it is that made you think the negative one was negative or the positive one was positive. All right, identical situation handled two different ways. Here's the first script. Just read through that yourself if you would. Alrighty, now I'm going to trans transfer to the second script, and I'd like you to do the same thing. Read through it. Alrighty. Now I'll bet most all of you concluded that this one is not so hot. So I'd like to go through the actual language choice of the teacher and analyze how there are embedded messages in it. You know, as, as human beings, we are remarkably subtle and sophisticated in how we interpret language. Uh, George Lakoff wrote a book about political speech once in which he said, when George W. first ran for president, he promised that if he got elected, he'd provide tax relief. Relief. Relief is one of those words with embedded meanings. It assumes that you're being oppressed, and I'm going to relieve you from that oppression. So without having to say that, just the use of the phrase carries the intention. So here, the kid says, I can't do number four. The teacher says, you can? Why not? We're in trouble already, aren't we? I mean, if the kid knew why he couldn't do it, he'd be able to do it. All right, so the kid says, I just can't do it. The teacher says, don't say you can't do it. We never say we can't do it. Now, that statement may come from good intentions. Maybe the teacher just went to a, a workshop on the growth mindset <laughs> or something, or, or their parents said, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. But if you're a kid on the receiving end of that, think for a second about how it hits you. You know, it's like, oh, I did something wrong. And then the teacher says, it's getting worse. Did you try hard? Now, how am I going to answer that question? If I did try hard, then the only conclusion is what? Mm-hmm, I guess I, I don't have it in some way. 
if I say no, I didn't try hard, then I'm confirming you're the slug that I you always thought I was. So that, that it's a no-win question. So anyway, moving on, the kid says, yeah, I tried hard, but I, I still can't do it. So the teacher says, well, you did the first three problems. Maybe if you went back and worked a little longer, you could do the fourth one too. I wanted to work at it a little more and see what happens. Now, I'm, I'm going to be a little facetious here, but, you know, just keep doing what you were doing before that didn't work, and maybe the sky will part and God will come down and you, with a guardian angel and sit by your side and a miracle will happen. There's nothing really here to express confidence in the kids or to give them guidance or clues. And it's quite different in this one. Uh, I can't do number four, says the kid. And the teacher says, what part don't you understand? Now, there's one magic word in that question. If I did turn and talk now, many of you would probably say, yeah, it's part. There's an acknowledgement in there that you do understand parts. So I just want you to un identify for me where you lost the thread of meaning. Kid says, I just can't do it. Well, I know you can do part of it because you've done the first three correctly. Expression of confidence. The fourth is similar, but just a little harder. Two things there, acknowledgement of difficulty, and there's a similarity, a pattern maybe, that you can identify that both problems have. Then comes the clue. You start out the same, but then you have to do one extra step. Review the first three problems, and then start number four again. See if you can figure it out, end of clue. Now comes the promise. I'll come by your desk in a few minutes to see how you're doing. In other words, you're not on your own, but I'm not going to do it for you. In this class, kids do the work, but I'm not going to leave you hanging, and I'll come back in a few minutes to see how you're doing, and if you need help, I'll be here to guide you to the next step. So um, each one of these nine um, entries here is an arena of classroom life, a regularly recurring time, place, event, scene, setting, where the way we structure our language and the words we choose can either embed a positive or a negative or a neutral or a non-expectation for the kids. And we've looked at number four, persevering return and giving help. Um, a few others that are really worth investigation. I was doing a workshop earlier today with uh, a large group of teachers on this. We took the, we took the first three together. That is to say, the uh, teacher gives frequent quizzes, but uses them not to give grades or uh, rankings to kids, but to produce a flow of data to the students about what they don't understand or do understand. You know, when, when we interview kids about this, they say things like, well, you know, it's, it's not really for grading, it's sort of like going to your doctor for a checkup. We self-correct the quizzes and then we try and analyze why we made the mistakes because we have to fix them. So that's one pattern you see in the classroom of a high expectation teacher. Another one down here is student goal setting, where part of, of how to be a good student that I teach kids is how to pick reasonable goals to set and make a plan of action to meet them. Uh, interestingly enough, goal setting as a, uh, an, an approach to teaching with students, where the students own the goal. It's not me setting a goal for them, it's the students doing the goal setting. It has a long tradition of research going back to the 50s as a one of those high gain strategies and it shows up also in John Hattie's work. Now here are a few ex excerpted categories of cognitive behavior and I highlighted in red number 24. Some of you may know this by uh, one of its other names which is accountable talk. It's a, cat it's a constellation of teacher behaviors where the robust dialogue is a constant feature of the interaction amongst the kids and they do more talking than the teacher does always having to justify their thinking, and the teacher uh, does not make judgments about right or wrong, but focuses the kids on examining and understanding each other's thinking and talking to each other about it. That's part of the climate that people create, or this is one way to create that climate, where risk-taking is uh, not just authorized, but encouraged. Now, this is the one about effective effort. Um, adapting some of uh, Howard's earlier work, we use six items uh, for our definition of effective effort. The first one is as a student, 
having an understanding of how much time it ought to take to, say, check a geometry proof or revise an essay or figure out how to understand from context words you didn't understand in the, in the text that you just read. Uh, that's not as simple as it may seem. Two of my four kids did not understand that. And they thought 15 minutes at night was quite enough time to revise an essay. <laughs> it, it wasn't. Uh, this one is teaching kids about how to eliminate distractions, uh, things that sidetrack you from focusing on your work. And this one says, part of my job is to teach kids the strategies for problem solving, for doing tasks, for approaching academic um, jobs. Uh, and uh, in the context of this one, modeling thinking aloud turns out to be one of the effective, most effective ways to teach kids the internal thinking routines for unpacking a word problem and figuring out what it's really asking, or figuring out a word from context, or three other approaches if the context approach doesn't work. And there's three more elements. One of them is Hey, it's okay to ask for help. In fact, good students always do that. And I want to help you figure out where to go and what to do when you're stuck. That's a part of the climate of the classroom. There's a tremendous amount of research on feedback. No matter whose synthesis, no matter whose meta-analysis of the research you look at, feedback is always close to the top. In the, in the 90s, it was Bellin and Bellin. In the 2000s, it was Bob Marzano. In the current decade, it's John Hattie always at the top of the list. But two things about that. Number one, it has to be good feedback. It has to be feedback information that captures the qualities of being specific and timely and non-judgmental and points out the distance between what the kid did and what a performance uh, at quality would look like. That in turn requires there be criteria for success behind it. And then what we're at here is once I have uh, established my own facility as a teacher at giving good feedback, I have to get the kids to use it. And Hattie's interesting finding is if you have grades and feedback on the paper at the same time, guess what? They never really look at the feedback. And the students who perform best in the generations of comparison studies are kids who get feedback only. So if we go into study this one in some depth, the challenge is to figure out how to create high quality feedback, give the kids time to use it, and still deal with the external realities of a school system uh, and an external audience that wants grades. Well, we can't eliminate grades altogether in most places, but we can certainly minimize the frequency of them and maximize the frequency and quality of the feedback. And the sixth element of effective effort is commitment, being determined to do well and make it your best work. And goal setting is just about the most powerful lever of influence on that. There are, there are some schools where you'll see all six of these posted on signs on, in the hallway as you walk around. That includes uh, elementary, middle, and high schools. Ev Evanston Township High School in uh, Evanston, Illinois has this all over the place on the actual walls. Okay. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few other areas that are an important part of this, this constellation of things that we do. Um, choice and voice is the category here. And voice means I feel like I show up here. I feel like I have some influence, some say, some value in the system of class and school that surrounds us. So that number 36 there really calls for culturally relevant teaching. That means that as a kid, the, the values, the artifacts, the history, the story in some way, my family and my culture shows up in the connections my teacher can make when illustrating curriculum points. And I feel known and valued by my teacher as a person. They have an interest in my life. But that also connects to an interest in the, uh, in the history of my family and my culture. Uh, I won't spend time on Roman numeral 6 and Roman numeral 7, but I just want to mention that at, if you get out of the classroom and you start looking at a school where the whole institution is committed to high expectation teaching and getting kids to believe in themselves, you start see it, seeing it show up in that commitment in the policies and the practices 
and the procedures of the school. For example, when we hire teachers, I want to know they believe in the growth mindset. I want to know they believe they have to teach kids strategies and what perseverance really means. And uh, this is especially for secondary schools that are successful with this business of high expectation teaching. I want to establish connections to the community where people who look like my kids can prove to them that education benefited them and helped them make for a better life. All righty. Now, um, there is one great enemy to this entire platform here, and the enemy looks like this, the bell curve of ability. This is not just a statistical phenomenon, it is a belief system that says ability, intelligence, capacity to be proficient at math or writing or anything is a thing that either you have or you don't. It's real and it's innate, it comes with the territory. As you emerge from your mother's womb, whatever you got, you're not gonna get any more, it's fixed. Unfortunately, some of us have more of it than others. And it does determine how you're going to do in life, of course, but fortunately, we can measure it and create a, an appropriate educational environment for you. Now, you may have noticed a little edge of sarcasm creeping into my voice as I went through those last couple of items. I have to tell you, I believe that for most of my life. I don't think you can grow up in the United States without inhaling it as a belief system. And it wasn't until I was in my 40s, I'm now in my mid-70s, that I started experiencing things that challenged that. And there are a number of historical figures, along with Carol Dweck, who made immense contributions here. Alfred Bandura, Jerome Weiner, Jeff Howard, whom I mentioned before. But it never achieved much, um, much uh, common interest or discussion because the alternative belief, which is represented by this chart, didn't have advocates who managed to reach the general public. Here's the alternative belief system. If I get you to exert effective effort, not just harder or longer, but effective effort, and you achieve an increment of achievement, it's going to build your confidence, and this is going to become a self-reinforcing cycle. It doesn't mean that there isn't something hardwired into kids that may be different from one another, but it's a minor factor in comparison to my ability to learn how to exert effective effort. So what you're gonna experience if you're in my class is I'm gonna teach you the attributes of effective effort and how to exert them and give you strategies you didn't have before. Because if you're stuck, it isn't because there's anything wrong with your brain. Either there's gaps in knowledge or strategies missing from your repertoire. Now, the, the history of how the United States got to be the strongest bastion of fixed belief in, um, in the fixed mindset is a very interesting one. And I, all I can do in, in our time is urge you to study it because it isn't like we're the only country in the world that believes this, but it is stronger, it is more deep-rooted and more influential and more permeating how we do school here than any other place in the world. And it happened during a particular time in our history, between 1890 and 1920. Prior to that period, there was no tracking. Everybody got the same curriculum. There were no different uh, um, courses for kids at different ability. So here's what went on. The convergence of four historical forces arrived between that time. Waves of immigration, people who looked different from the uh, white majority, coming a, a million a year, building new high schools like crazy, concentration of people in cities, and the end of the agrarian economy, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the factory system, and the need to sort people. We have the capitalists who provide the investment money. We have the, the CEOs and the managers who run the factories. We have the line foremen who uh, supervise the, um, the implementation of the line. And we have the people who come in after work and sweep up. Now, at the same time as these two things were going on, waves of people coming to our shores through Ellis Island and elsewhere, the Industrial Revolution, comes the era of scientific management and the belief that we can measure human behavior. 
this word here is about Frederick Winslow Taylor. Now, the only way that we know about him today, at least in the popular imagination, is the movie Cheaper by the Dozen. You know, 1950, Clifton Webb, uh, in the 2000s, it's remade with Steve Martin playing the lead part. And this guy has 12 kids. And the comedy is the sort of the, the efficiency routines in which the, uh, that, that he puts in place and that they run the family. But this guy was the first efficiency expert in our history and created that industry. The efficiency expert uh, is a person who goes into a factory and who takes out a stopwatch and times how long workers take to do various tasks, then recommends improvements. So the measurement of human behavior was not yet anything like intelligence. It was the measurement of efficiency and speed. So that's the third historical force. The fourth one is social Darwinism. Herbert Spencer, a Brit, Spencer says, you know, survival of the fittest, that's a great idea. I bet it explains more than just why certain species rise and survive and get stronger. I'll bet it explains why certain people rise and get stronger and gain power and influence. We still don't have intelligence tests. We still don't have the concept of intelligence, but it's starting to grow, and these forces are going to support it big time. Um, there is a catalog of people whom we won't go through now and a series of events that starts in England and then comes to our shores when a guy named McTell, who is a student of, uh, of a Brit named Galton, coins the term mental test. We still don't have mental tests, but he says there ought to be one. We ought to be able to measure kids and sort them in schools according to their, quote, ability. Um, now, the person that invented the very first test that we, we called intelligence test, he didn't, is a Frenchman named Alfred Binet. And uh, I would like you to, to read a few statements that Binet said about the test that was imported to this country and used um, at the behest of the advocates listed in the previous page to evaluate kids' supposed ability in school. Here's the first one. Take a second if you wouldn't read this. We may not designate what they measure intelligence or any other reified entity, any other thing that's a thing, re reus being the Latin word for thing, made into a thing. Here's another quote. Here's the guy who invented the test saying, should be used for ranking normal children. Is one more. And the final one. Why? Had Binet's own ideas become so twisted and adapted when they were brought over to this country? Well, Stephen Jay Gould, in his book, The Mismeasurement of Man, was the first person to take that on. It's a book I really recommend, but it, it does uh, give a sort of a, a, an eye-opening, bracing view about what is so easy for most of us, including me, to have internalized for most of our life, the fact that it is true. Here, here's a statement that uh, Benet made, uh, and it was it was summarized in one of Seymour Saracen's book. What what Benet said, I'll back up one slide. Intelligence isn't a thing; it's educable. So he advocated training. He called it mental orthopedics to teach children to do the things in the last two lines: observe, listen, retain, judge better. And then he says. If you do that, the kids are going to gain self-confidence and perseverance. And then the last sentence. 
they should especially be taught to will, desire, ganas, will with more intensity, to will. That is indeed the key to all education. Now, this is something that we as educators have to confront inside ourselves because it's not an easy sell for us that were participating in this webinar or the teachers who, with whom we work in our schools to just swallow this hole because we're giving them evidence. And there's plenty of evidence out there. You know, here's, here's one piece. It's true. If you look at IQ scores in the United States on IQ tests, they go up nine points per generation. Only you and I never knew that because we didn't know that the tests are renormed every 10 years. So the peak of the bell curve always comes out of 100. But if our grandparents had been given the tests that were given today, they likely would have scored in the retarded range. Now, your grandparents were not retarded and neither are mine. How could that be? What could possibly account for the fact that our IQ scores are getting up. Are we actually getting smarter as a country? And uh, David Berliner's answer to that in a book called The Manufactured Crisis was, in 1910, less than 10% of students left eighth grade and even entered high school. And every decade, the number of kids who go to high school and graduate from high school goes up to 78, 79, 80%. So, what if the things that IQ tests measure are educable? Pretty good hypothesis, because if you look at the subtests on an IQ test, whether it's the Stanford Binet, it still bears his name, by the way, 110 years later, or the WISC, there's always a test of general knowledge in there. Um, there is a, a, an assessment of vocabulary, things that could be increased in proficiency because of education. and. Um, if you're interested in this, in the, in the book that Charlene mentioned at the beginning, there are other sort of startling facts that go against the grain of this idea that, uh, of course, ability is something that's inherited. In the verbal behaviors category, the number nine was strong pushback when the kids has something out of their discouragement mindset that says, you know, oh, Mr. Sapir, my Nobody in my family has ever been good at math. You know, I appreciate what you're trying to do for me, but my father never could do math either. Quick as a flash, if I'm in that pushback mode, I'm going to say, well, he would have been good if he'd had me for a teacher because there's nothing wrong with his math brain and there's nothing wrong with yours, Jason. Come on, sit down here. We're going to find out where the gaps are. That's what's going on here. We're going to do something about it. Now, I can't do that with confidence unless I have some information about the kid that allows me to say he has a good brain. And I also can't do it unless I really believe it. That is why woven through all this work is confronting our own belief systems. And uh, ultimately what we found in our work is that the best convincer of a teacher that the growth mindset is true is putting as many of these 50 ways as we can get them to try out to work on one kid who, who has self-stereotyped him or herself as not able not good enough, less than. If you get that one kid to change that mindset about themselves, then the conclusion that uh, I'm going to reach as a teacher is, hey, I, I could have been doing this for more kids. So this is the contrary evidence. And once it is really internalized, it shows up in how you handle every situation that comes your way. And you don't have to memorize lines anymore. It just comes out of you, like you're about to see it come out of a, a high school math teacher named, named Zach. This is Zach Herman, who at the time we made this clip was at Evanston Township High School. Now, he, uh, once a week, he does what you're going to see in this clip. But what I urge you all to pay attention to is the language he uses when he frames reteaching. In other words, he's going to have kids who didn't get certain concepts come up in groups, this high school teacher now, within the boundaries of this one class period and get some uh, extra input on the things they weren't uh, or, or are not yet proficient at. And um, the, the point about this is what you say at a moment like this, how you frame the reteaching can either 
convey to the kids, I believe in you, what we're doing is important and you can do it, or not. It can say, you know, here, <laughs> here you are once again in the group that uh, is the bluebirds and didn't get it. So listen to his language and then we'll go back and examine it a little bit. So Jason, I mean, uh, uh, Jeff, let's, let's play that clip of Zach getting ready to call kids up for reteaching. Mr. Herman has given his students three problems as they come through the door. Okay. So I'm giving it back to you, John, and if you want to share your desktop again, that'd be excellent. All right, thank you. I will push that little button and share my screen. Now, folks, uh, every class, he doesn't do what we just saw in every class. Um, he does it probably about once a week. And um, other days you go in there, it would look like many other classes you'd see. There'd be some total class instruction that sometimes there's a lot of group work. He teaches the kids social skills so that they interact in positive ways. He tends to get the kids who either fail eighth grade math or do very poorly in it. And uh, once again, he's one of these folks who gets more than one year's worth of gain in one academic year for kids. Uh, there's a lot we could talk about with respect to this clip, you know, like the, 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 the fact that kids are given some choice uh, if they have an A slash S. Um, and they do exercise that choice, sometimes in funny ways. I, I happen to have been the guy with the camera in the class that day. And so there's one kid who got each E slash S. He doesn't go up and join the group when uh, Zach calls it, but he goes up and he sits right next to them at the table, facing the other way with his ears flapping toward what the group is doing. So he, he got his choice, right? Now, um, I'd like to go over some of the, of, of the ways he, he phrased things. First of all, he says, okay, this is my favorite part. Now, there's a sentence. Why do you think it's his favorite part? Or what 
implicit message are the kids getting from him saying, well, this is my favorite part. You know, it's probably that, hey, I, I get my satisfaction from you guys learning it. That's what I'm with. And then he says, where everybody gets what they need. So everybody needs something is the implication there. Some of you need an extension problem. Some of you need a session in order to refine a concept. There, there's a certain equality of language that is going on here, including this next one here. Uh, if, if, if you have an E, it means you're ready for an extension problem. If you have an, if you have an S, it means you're ready for the support session. And then he underlines it. You know, that's the whole point, that we all leave here making sure we understand how every single one of these problems. Then it is, you can do this message. I've seen you do it in the past. I know you're going to do it together uh, today. So whatever you need at this time, there it is again, that's what's going to happen. Um, what I'm urging those of you who are in a supervisory or a coaching position to do is emerge from this webinar, at least a little bit having, uh, or, or if you're a teacher, we've grown a third ear. We're going to listen to ourselves. What are we saying when we handle these everyday situations and what implicit messages are being communicated to the students. And for those of you who are supervisors, follow me around if you visit my classroom so you can pick up what's going on here and use that as, as, as data for the two of us to examine how I may or may not be sending embedded messages to kids. You know, we, we rarely see each other as others see us and hardly ever hear ourselves as others do. And uh, some of you will remember the Rosenthal and Jacobson were called Pygmalion in the Classroom, 1968, they discovered that teachers treat kids differentially in based on what their prediction is about their ability. And, um, you know, that's been summarized in numerous places. There was a whole staff development program called TESA, T-E-S-A. And I'll bet some of you are nodding your heads remembering that. Teacher Expectations and Student Achievement. Your observation was built into that, doing this very thing we're talking about, taking dialogue down and then going over it to see if indeed I smile and nod more towards some kids because I think they're brighter. I give more wait time to certain kids and not others. I ask more interesting higher level questions to certain kids and not others. Um, if we're going to do anything about the achievement gap in this country, I really feel it is incumbent upon us, you know, at, at the school level to take on this challenge of being self-conscious and deliberate about the messages we're sending to kids about our belief in them. If we look at the, at the literature on the achievement gap, you know, there's lots of causes that people highlight. One of them is that certain kids are in advantaged families where they go to museums and travel and have lively dinnertime conversations as opposed to other kids whose parents are both working and they never have dinner together and don't have a, you know, a rich language or book environment around their house. That's unequal opportunity. And I think it's fair to call it an opportunity gap uh, in addition to an achievement gap. Another reason can be my culture is invisible in the school. And so I don't feel like this is really a, a place for me or my family. Third reason can be the actual uh, manifestation of stereotype threat. Brilliant work by Claude Steele, a book called Whistling Vivaldi. Um, it can also be that uh, the way in which a person get, a kid gets into special ed here uh, or placed in tracks has some biases that uh, create or have us contributing through our structures to the achievement gap. What we've been talking about today, however, is the belief I have in able brain, that I can grow its capacity. This is the one over which I think we have most explicit control. We can do a great deal with culturally relevant teaching here, a great deal with equity audits here. But I would like to start at least by examining my behavior in class with kids and getting some of these 50 ways to get kids to believe in themselves to be alive, functioning, strong, and present in my practice. So the way to deal with this then is to 
look at having expectations that all the kids in my class can do high level, high level thinking, even if they're a couple of years behind academically. Getting them to believe they can grow their ability, giving them the confidence that that formula applies to them, and giving them the tools to do it, like teaching them exactly what effective effort is. So I think this would be a good time to pause and see if we can handle a few questions, Jeff, from our participants today, and then I'll be getting a whole lot in writing to respond to it. Hey, you guys are giving me a lot of homework. Terrific, thanks. I have a few questions for you. Would you recommend beginning this work with teachers before asking teachers to shift, or can this be approached school-wide with both teachers and students at the same time? Well, I think the, that the, the way to start is to actually start by looking inside. I do an activity where uh, I have, you know, we'll do a, a shared book read, say, of Carol Dweck's book, Mindsets. But along the way, at a faculty meeting, I'm going to say, you know what? Every one of us in this room has something we know we're not good at. You know, it might be dancing, or it might be math, or it might be singing, or it might be, you know, mixing with people at cocktail parties. I, you know, sit me down one to one, I'm great, but I don't like those. Well, so you have people identify it. Everybody has something, and you ask them to write down what it is, number two, what is the event that happened after which you were sure you weren't good at that? Because you weren't born thinking you couldn't sing or couldn't do math. What was the event? Somebody rolled their eyes or you got an F on a test or you got laughed at. So what's the thing you can't do? What's the event after which you knew it was true? What feelings did you have? And what were the consequences? And if you have people share that in groups of five, there are some poignant experiences and there's always a pattern. The pattern is, for the most part, they never did it again. That was the last math course I ever took. Or you could never get me near a skating rink again, even if you had a shotgun aimed at my head. So I, I guess the, the answer I'm saying is start by having people study the history of the idea of intelligence and do a little looking inside. And then get a few champions who are willing to start uh, doing case studies of kids who have negative stereotypes of themselves and get them to report out uh, what's happening. Uh, the last thing is if you're an administrator, build yourself into the plan. That is to say, you're gonna double team that kid and you're gonna start changing behaviors. Uh, you'll greet them at the door and ask them how they did with the goal setting if that's what the teacher is doing. Um, there isn't, isn't, isn't really a formula for how to start, but I would recommend um, some common study uh, without any mandates for people and the development of champions. What's another one, Jeff? Terrific. Why don't I, oh, well, let's, uh, let's answer another. <clears throat> I work at a juvenile detention center. How can I work on getting students to gain confidence when some have already given up? Well, a great many of kids in juvenile detention center are um, going to wind up in other kinds of jails later on. And uh, as I'm sure many of our participants know, uh, many of them are close to illiterate or way, way, way behind. So I want to pair the, the development of actual skills with the conveying of messages that I believe in them and that it's worth doing. And along with that, uh, I think it's, uh, we got to give kids reasons for developing uh, academic skills. The kids who are in juvenile detention center, there's, there's no stereotype of who they are. There's all different kinds of reasons why they wound up there. Um, but they may well not have images of how they can um, forge a path to a better life if they get an education. And so um, somehow I want to create a, uh, a forum for them to meet other people that maybe I'm going to bring in that will testify to how it benefited from them. I want people who look like them and who have had some of their experiences to make a case that it's worth uh, doing like this crazy teacher of yours to trying to convince you that you have an able brain. Hey, you know what? You do. Terrific. Why don't we uh, answer one more question? 
Uh, effective strategies were mentioned a few times with a couple of examples of strategies. Is there a website that would provide a comprehensive list of strategies that should be taught to elementary students? Um, there are three compendiums of them, and I listed them in the uh, in the bibliography of the, of the book that Charlene is going to talk to you about. I don't think I haven't found one one website that has a catalog of strategies, but these compendiums. Uh, one of them was compiled by a school district. Uh, one of them comes from uh, a, a a company, and I would recommend getting getting a hold of them. But I guess the, I guess the quick answer is no. There is not a website that has all of the good strategies listed. Well, I think we have time for one more activity. question. Why don't we uh, Why don't we ask one more? Uh, our school focuses on differentiation. So is it wrong that you don't ask some children the more difficult questions? Yeah. Yes. Now that was a quick answer, wasn't it? I think one of the most uh, common and, and potentially dangerous assumptions is that kids who are behind in skills, literacy skills, can't think at a high level. They absolutely can. And uh, what I need to do is give them material that either has mathematical problems or has uh, reading at the correct level for the kids. But I have to, if, if I focus them on skill and drill, I'm going to kill their interest in literature and thinking. So it, it is a mistake to deny higher level tasks to kids who have lower level skills because the skills at which they function at a lower level are teachable and the thinking skills that allow them to make inferences or evaluate why a character might have done a particular thing in a story are uh, much, much higher than we give them credit for. Well, Charlene, it may be time for you. What do you say, Jeff? Yeah, perfect. Why don't we do that? Where is Charlene Maher? Can you get Charlene uh, in on our uh, conversation here, Jeff? Hi, this is Maura. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Excellent presentation, John. And um, Charlene must be having a technical difficulties. I just want to say thank you to everyone for participating in this. You will be follow up from us and we're um, going to deliver to all of you a special offer uh, um, for having us participate in this um, presentation and just look for um, an email that's likely to come within the next case, day or two. Along with the, uh, along with the certificate Certificate of attendance. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you very much, Maura. And yeah, just to, to, to say again, because it was a, it was a little uh, muffled, that everyone will get a certificate of attendance, and here's the information for purchasing John's book, and there's the access code, the discount code, when you go to purchase it. And all of this information will be in the video that you receive later in the week. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks, Jeff, and thanks, John. Thanks, John. My pleasure, Maura. Thank you, folks, for showing up this evening.